Previously on Ride on Track. <laughs> and this has been the Ride on Track podcast. See you guys. Bye. See you around. Farewell. Right, great episode, everyone. I'll get that locked and loaded, and we should release that next week. It was on that day that I saw Tom Denham leaving the studio where he recorded right on track. He was alone. I was alone. And I knew from my lord and master exactly what I had to do. I had to make sure nobody else could see me, so I waited until he turned down an empty, dark, yet suspicious alleyway, for good measure. Hello. May I help you? Yes, 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 I think you can. (laughs) Ah! Work, Andrew. We have Denim right where we want him. Away from the controls that make the podcast tick. Nobody will notice we're the ones pulling all the strings. Throw him away in the Australian bush, where he can be stranded forever, and nobody can find him. But Master, why don't we just throw them all into the Shadow Realm? If we do, they'll put their heads together and get out of there. We can't have that. But what about the others? noticed? Oh, we will reveal ourselves when the time comes. Don't you worry. Day 30. There's no sign of getting home. I've been lost in the Australian bush for goodness knows how long. One moment I was in the Ride on Track studio, the next morning I woke up here. Who knows what's gonna happen? Whether I get back though, well, we'll find out, won't we? Well, now I've completely lost my sense of direction. Haven't we all heard that one before? (gasps) Mr. Conductor? That's right, Tom Denham. It's me. I am real. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Does this officially canonize Thomas and the Magic Railroad? Uh, We'll talk about that another time. What we need to do now is get you home. You've got to go back to the Right on Track podcast right now! Well, that's what I've been trying to do, but it doesn't help when you're lost in the bush. It must be an important day if you've gone to all this trouble to get me back. (laughs) It is a very important day. It's a fortunate thing that I brought along my family's supply of gold dust. But what is the source? That would be telling our family's secret. But we must hurry. Who knows what's out here? Probably a lot of snakes, alligators, scorpions, spiders, the usual. Ooh, let's get out of here. Sounds good. But what's the way? This is the way. My only chance. Sparkle, sparkle, sparkle! That was successful? They, uh, they didn't notice? Nobody batted an eye. We've done it. We've taken over the podcast. It's ours. But do they understand our true origins? Like, I, 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 thought, the, I, thought, the, I thought the whole, like, evil motif gave that away. Like... We haven't had any listeners email about it, so I assume all is fine. That's what you think. How 
did you escape? With a little bit of help. I have come to claim what is rightfully mine. Well, you're too late, Tom Denham. Andrew, Barry, Chuck, and I have taken over the podcast. It's ours now. Podcast Podcast What's going on? Who was that? Behold, I am the controller of the podcast. I am an omnipresent being that keeps the podcast intact. I am data, knowledge, and statistics so bundled up into a movie voice. I didn't know we had a controller. Believe it or not, every podcast has one. Well then, great controller. What podcast error have you detected? You two, Khaled Fan, the underscore chairboard, and the very truck, the nuts of this universe! You are from the Shadow Realm! Wait, 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 wait. So you're not the real versions of yourselves. The Khaled Fan, the underscore chairboard, and the very truck I know in this world. A different people? Okay, okay. You got me. We're from the anti-universe. And we thought taking over the podcast would be the perfect disguise for us to exist here. Yeah, nobody would notice, wouldn't they? It's just a podcast after all. Your very being here has interfered with the podcast's existence, creating a sneaky infinity. <laughs> Because of us? And if your existence here continues, you all cease to exist. All I wanted was to just be a podcast host again. And maybe you can. If you return to your universe, you can always be the Thomas Talk podcast host I never was. Maybe you're right, Tom Denham. Maybe you're right. Can you get us home, Great Controller? What about me? You will have to go back to the podcast, but not in its current state. What do you mean? If you are to remove the Swiss Infinity, the podcast needs to change. And the universe will remain together again. We need to change. Will everyone be returned? Connor and Parry and myself? Everybody is returning to their rightful place as we speak. Connor, Parry, and you will too. Good. I look forward to seeing them again. Connor, you're both here. Oh, hey, Denim. Denim? <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a while. Okay, you guys, you guys have missed a lot. So, um, time to get you right on track with it all. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon from wherever you are in the world. Welcome to episode 60 of the Right on Track podcast. My name is Connor Jonas, and I am not joined alone. It gives me a great pleasure to re-welcome back to the podcast, Tom Parry. Hello, Connor. I'm so pleased to be back. And Tom Denham. Hello, everybody. It's been a long time, but nevertheless, it's great to be here. And it's the original trio, the original Right on Track trifecta. That it is. 
the three big engines, despite the fact that I'm quite short. <laughs> You're about as tall as I am, Connor. I'd hardly call that short. Fair, fair. But denim. Denim, you're tall. Yeah, I'm immense. Like, I'm in Sydney, you're in Melbourne, you can see me from where you're sitting. <laughs> They've recently added a little red blinking light on top of you, haven't they? To, to protect the airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I've missed this. Now, we have a bit of a strange episode coming up today, but Connor, do, do spill, do tell us, what have we got planned for today's episode? Because you two have missed a bunch of reviews, Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be a good idea if we went over the episodes that you two didn't get to rate. Go and give a brief synopsis of them, you guys can give a brief talk about each episode, and then you can give your own scores for it. And then, after a usual musical interlude, I thought, since, you know, Series 7 and the classic series, we're moving on to Series 8, we should go back to the start. In the very first episode of the podcast, it was just Denim and myself. And it was only in episode two, Harry, that you joined us. Mm -hmm, That's correct. Which means you were unfortunate to not to be able to review those first four episodes. That's right, yes. Um, I am actually very much looking forward to covering these stories. And as you say, I haven't done them before on this podcast. So, yeah, can't wait. So... You guys missed a fair few episodes that you didn't get to review. You missed about ten of them. I think we should get right into it with the episodes of Series 7. Please, Murdoch chuffed, I want some peace and quiet, and I don't want to share a shed with chatterboxes. I need Diesel to help for a while. Yes, said Fergus unhappily. Vegetable? Huh. I'm going to carry passages. Horses can't fly. Where's Scar Lowy? He promised to be on time. Decorations aren't dignified for an important engine like me. I have plenty of water. You can't be a reliable engine if you can't get through the snow. It might fall down if it's not repaired. I'll race you, Thomas. You're on, whistled Thomas. Harry, I think we've got quite a bit of work to do here, don't we? I think we do, Den, and let's just jump right into it now. So, Peace and Quiet, it is episode number 17 in series 7 of Thomas and Friends, as it is now called, of course. And, well, well, we've gone through the synopsis and the plot and all that before. We know that Murdoch's new to the island and he doesn't like noise of any kind to the point where, you know, he just rudely speaks to all the engines who were just trying to make his acquaintance. I mean, that was a point that both Connor and M said in episode 56 of the podcast. Yeah, he's got no reason to be rude. I mean, surely if you're new to the island, you at least want to make the effort to get to know people and not be carrying this stigma that you're somebody who's, well, rude. There's no other way of saying it. He's rude. But I think unintentionally as well, he's very self-absorbed in the sense that he would rather just kind of be on his lonesome but I think that doesn't convey to his fellow engine colleagues in the best way possible. Yeah, um, I have to say Murdoch is someone we don't see a lot of. After Series 12, we never see him again, which is disappointing because he looks great and I kind of like him. Like, even though he's rude to begin with, he's a very charming character. Yeah, uh, I will say uh, he's a unique character. He He... he... Doesn't hit any of the previous stereotypes of a character in the show. He likes the quiet and he's a bit shy. He's essentially complete opposite of James. <laughs> More or less, yeah, that's a good analogy. I think what's particularly interesting about a character like Murdoch, he, he strays from the, the normal kind of desirable character i think a character that has a flaw is probably more interesting i think for instance that's why i would say enjoy duncan more than i would peter sam because peter sam is quite a happy character whereas duncan is a bit more of an anti-hero so i feel here uh, murdoch is um, an interesting character to observe but i agree with your sentiments parry you you don't get to see a lot of him but from what we do see in future episodes he's an interesting spectacle Mm. Mm-hmm. And let's go on to a few of the points that were raised by Connor and M in episode 56. One was that it was lovely to see flashbacks 
they're reusing footage from Fish in Series 4 of the TV program. I have to say, I'm not a fan of Series 7 doing this. I think we might have discussed this before, but it just comes across as lazy. Like, they can't shoot any new footage, so they just have to repurpose old stuff, which doesn't match the aesthetics of Series 7. It's Yeah, that doesn't... Yeah, it doesn't gel. It does make you wonder, like, what's going on behind the scenes. Do you reckon that, like, hit entertainment is saying, come on, you got to finish this one so we could get on to the glorious new feature that is Series 8? Um, like, I-, I wonder if there was that pressure there. I, I do feel like it is a bit tacked on um, in quite a few episodes from this season. And I also do feel it's a little bit like a... It does, like, for a, a viewer, it feels like a bit of a last-minute thought. And I do wonder, like, how systematic it is. It kind of just feels like something that's dealt with later. So I would have liked to have seen what these shots would have looked like in Series 7 rather than what we got. So I have to agree with you there, Parry. Time constraints is a possibility. Possibly budgetary constraints as well. It's possible, and I've got... No evidence that this is the case, but it's possible that Hit Entertainment said to the team, look, we're going to give you a smaller budget this series. Try to cut corners where you can. And of course, this was one example where they had to do that. Hmm. This is all purely hypothetical. Yep. It, it, exactly, yeah. We Again, we've got no evidence of this. We're just spitballing ideas. Uh, and now, in terms of some points that M raised, I think that this story is very photogenic. There's a lot of nice... Scenic shots, of course, the set decoration isn't as nice as it is in, say, Series 4, which is incredible, but uh, it's nice enough. Oh, you pointed out that Murdoch was orange, did you not, Connor? Uh, Yeah, he's a mustard yellow orangey colour. Yeah, I'd I'd say he's more of an ochre. An ochre. Mm. You're using very unique words there. Ochre. Yes. So ochre's kind of like a a rusted dark orange. Yeah, I'm looking at that on Google now. I can see that. Yep. He's bright though. He's not dark. No, it's it's not. It's not a dull ochre. It is like quite a vivid sort of. Do you know what they call dark orange? What do they call dark orange? Brown. Dark Orange is brown. He looks nothing like Toby, although Toby does make an appearance in Peace and Quiet. He does, of course, helping to herd the sheep away. Oh, another point that M raised, which I also liked, was how Murdoch's eyes darted back and forth to um, convey that his driver and fireman were trying to move the sheep along. One of my favourite shots in that episode. Hmm. Yeah, so I think overall it's just nice, this story. I mean, there's not a lot going on. It feels like there's a lot of filler, um, but it's charming. I mean, you can't help but enjoy it all the same. So where Connor and M gave it an 8, I'm going to give it a 6. Denim. More can be done with Murdoch as a character in this episode. I do like the the whole peace and quiet thing that is kind of thrown here into his character. That he's he's a bit of a BFG. He's a gentle giant. But mm. I, I think, like, given the the kind of engine he is, I think there could have been something a bit more interesting done here. Maybe if the supposedly the good strain he was pulling was one much larger than what, say, Henry Donald or Douglas could carry, mm. um, and there's an urgency kind of placed on it, I think that would have made for a bit more of an interesting story. But for what we did get, it's nice to see Harvey and Salty interact with a newbie as well. They've kind of been season characters for a season at least Mm. um so it's nice to see that so overall i think i'm gonna have to go with five okay then so the next story was fergus breaks the rules in which diesel tricked fergus at the cement works and sent him off to the scrapyard where fergus became very scared and he ran away he broke the rules yeah this one made no sense to me i mean First of all, why is Fergus, a stalwart of the cement works, taking orders from Diesel? How does Diesel think that he has any legitimacy or any leadership value over Fergus? I mean, I mean, it, it's kind of nice that Thomas goes to look for him and there's that friendship going there. But um, otherwise, yeah, Fergus, he only appears this series and it feels like not a lot has been done with him. I mean, in the stories he's appeared in, first of all, he was with bill and ben and he was being bossy there i mean you could argue that there's a flaw in the character there because he's going to a new 
work site and you know he's telling the two engines who've worked there longer who who know their way around what to do but no i'm i'm sorry I, and as well as that there's really not a lot going on here it's funny you say that because i disagree with you Perry. Oh. i think there's a lot of there's a lot of underlying stuff going on here that i think is really meaty fergus is either i, I think he is like his establishment at the cement works may have been for a while separate from the fat controllers right away but i think fergus is a very new addition to that space i reckon there's a, there's a bit of a superiority for him feeling like that he's the pride of the cement works and that's where he works and thus that pride kind of gets to him in bill benham fergus but i think as well when he's on his own at the cement works i think he feels a sense that oh he's got to work hard he's got to do the right thing by the owners and by the operations of the cement works and when um, they decide to bring in diesel into the operations to help him out he potentially feels a bit threatened and diesel having been on soda that little bit longer um, i feel like fergus is more likely to turn to him um, for voice of reason because he doesn't know at this point in time that diesel is villainous like he has had no prior relationship with him so i feel that fergus probably thinks that like diesel is no different from thomas or from uh mavis i think that he maybe kind of goes well if these engines who have been on soda for a lot longer are saying this and then diesel is saying this and obviously speaking from experience someone has spoken to him and he's uh, been promoted in that space but mm. i think what's really nice from here is that we get this story that kind of unravels where Fergus goes and, and kind of hastily as well, he goes a away from the cement works and um, he runs away to the smelters. And we get some lovely nighttime stuff here and we see Ari and Bert in the sheds there. But I think it's it, it's interesting like how this kind of all unfolds and in, in, in a very kind of sincere way, the fat controller reminds Fergus that he shouldn't listen to Diesel. Um, very kind of a similar kind of hearkening back to dirty work where diesel spreads rumors to the troublesome trucks for them to spread on to the big engines and they believe the the things that diesel uh, has said about duck that it, he, they think he's saying about them so it feels like a little bit of a, a nod to that if you like yeah i mean fergus has been there longer than diesel he is the pride of the cement works there is that sepia tone photograph at the beginning which gives you an indication of how long he's been there so the idea that a complete outsider would come in and boss fergus around is just yeah having said that i think rather than saying how long he's been there i think it's more an acknowledgement of the time period that this has been placed in mm, no <laughs> yep this is what I missed. This is what I missed with you two guys off in the wilderness and whatever else. Huh. Hmm. No, I, 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 yeah, I'm going to give it a five. It just doesn't do it for me. Denim? I think to close, um, I really like it. I think there's a lot of really nice production value here. Um, I think there's a bit more telling in the story rather than what's told vocally. I think it's more within the expression of emotion that you can kind of see underlying things going on i'm gonna give it a nine. Ooh, okay then nine. that is a little <laughs> bit shocking what i will say i think it is probably more superior to its predecessor being bill ben and fergus mm. see this is why you two had to return to these episodes and on the note of returnees, Boji rides again a hundred episodes after he first debuted, where a bunch of holiday makers on the island and Sir Topham Hat needs a bus to try and alleviate it. Boji is renovated, returned to service, however has some issues with some chickens. I love this episode. It kind of is a nice, not complete blast from the past but it's a nice kind of looking back through time at like one of the the one-time villains that we had back in the day do so well that they came back for a little bit more and i think that's what i really like about this one 
Mm, I agree. I adore this episode so much. I mean, it's filled with humour. Bulgy is such a fantastic character. The only drawbacks would be that, and this is a persistent criticism of mine throughout the first seven series of the show, it does show the limitations of using models and not having them move and not using animation and that kind of thing because when we see the chickens wake up, it's, we see feathers flying about and we see the backgrounds moving, but the chickens are just obviously static and so are the people. So, Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's one of those things, like, as I watch more and more, I've just come to accept it for what it is. Um, probably me going into old age, but um, it's, yeah. Mm. I, I don't see much fault with it. And I and whilst, like, I would have liked it more if Bulgy had a bit more of a sticky end, I kind of do like the idea that he's been turned into a vegetable bus, which, honestly, let's say it here, it's purely to make another toy. It's purely for yeah, marketing purposes. It is, purposes. yeah. Yeah. But it's cool how they did it. It is. And it's it's disappointing that he had to revert back to being a red double-decker bus as well. I mean, I want more stories of Bulgy the Vegetable Bus. What I still don't understand, and I brought this up in the original review, why has he still got the Free the Road sign? He's been renovated and they've kept his railway blasphemy is still firmly attached to him. Well, they got rid of the anti-rail league Yeah, stickers. that's because he was a proper railway bus. But then even when he's turned into a vegetable bus, when he's not even a proper bus anymore, he's still got the free the road sign. The owner felt like he had to kind of maintain some of Bulgy's history to say to people or locals that, like, you know, before Bulgy was a vegetable bus... He was a railway bus as well. Mm. It's a part of his uh, his tapestry. Yeah, but but before he was a vegetable bus and helped the farmers, uh, he was trying to destroy all the railways. That's a funny bit. You've got an evil bus here that you're buying your 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 eggplants, your carrots, and your cabbages mm. from. You know that that's. <laughs> you know what we never saw in this era of the show, but I feel like would have worked so well. A Bulgy and George story had those two characters, mm. two characters who are very tenaciously um, on the side of bias for road superiority and travel um, versus the steam engines. I feel like that's something pulled straight out of series six or seven. Mm. Mm. It would be interesting having a story where the protagonists are the antagonists. Mm. Yes. But, and also, I, I find it strange, Connor, that you and M didn't address the issue. Well, you did touch upon it, but you didn't really solve the mystery as to why Bulgy suddenly has a really nasally voice. I think it's age. Mm, or, or, or maybe, maybe it's the chickens. He spent too long around the chickens. It's blocked his nose. It's so pongy. <laughs> it could be a stuffed up radiator. Yes. And that's it. Yep, stuffed up radio. It's still better than the US version, though, of his new voice. Credit where due, Michael Brandon thought of so many different voices. They may not be accurate. Yes, he thought of so many different voices, and then he gave them all to Bulgy, who talks like this, then up like this, and then goes round like this, like a wave. Okay, then. So, what would you hmm. rank the vegetable bus? But yeah, that's the voice. Yep. Yeah, well done again, Thank Connor. You. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go for a nine. I love it. I love revisiting this story. It's a lot of fun. And even though there's not a lot of railway involved in there, it's, yeah, you can't help but enjoy it. I'm going to have to agree with you, Perry. It's a nine for me, too. I think it's definitely a lot of fun. Bulgy is a very iconic character. I think my only fault with it is that Thomas and Emily don't really add a huge amount to their story. Like, they're the marketable characters of this era. Um, like, you, you could put anybody in that space. But I think for who the focus is of this story, I think Bulgy is a sellout. He does such a good job. Mm, for sure. Also, we should mention as well, and I don't believe that this was stated in episode 56... Bulgy would go on to be voiced by Colin McFarlane when he returns in Series 17. And I think, honestly, that McFarlane's voice really does suit Bulgy's character. Mm. It really does. It's one of the best CGI voices out there. Moving from Episode 56 to Episode 57, we start with Harold and the Flying Horse, where there's a village fate, and Harold feels left out of it. 
However, he manages to go there when a horse called Pegasus falls in a ditch and Harold airlifts Pegasus, the flying horse, to the fate. Mm. There's, um, I can only reiterate the points that you and M made in uh, this episode, Connor. It's, it doesn't have a lot of meat to it. It's definitely one of the weaker stories, not just in Series 7, but of the show overall. It feels rushed, but at the same time, there's a lot of filler, like uh, Percy remarking about Pegasus being a funny name for a horse and then discovering that horses can fly. I mean, that's... Why is that there? It really doesn't need to be there. Yeah, very strange. Uh, Also, touching upon what Em said, it's the last ever appearance of Duke. I mean, yes, it's Series 4 stock footage, but still, at least he appears. And... Em also mentioned how it cleverly makes use of the rule of thirds, this story. But overall, like, I feel a bit of sympathy for Harold. When nobody needs rescuing, what can you do? But at the same time, Harold has so many other jobs. Like, he delivers the mail, he drops off supplies to people, he just surveys the area, takes visitors around the island. So it's not like he's ever lost for things to do. Uh, Denim? Yeah, th- th- this was one of the things as a kid and as a viewer now that frustrated me about this story is that whenever there's a fate of a party or a fun fair happening on the island of Sodor, the whole economy stops and places all focus on the fun thing going on for the day. <laughs> all the engines go there and everything just stops. And like, this story doesn't convince me that Harold has got nothing to do. Mm. Um, I like the sentiment of like the idea and pegasus the flying horse i think is cool and like the way they get him there is cool Mm. that's probably the high point of the story for me and it is the high point of the episode but i don't believe for a moment that everything on the island of sodor must stop because there is a summer fate quite right because the island of sodor of course if we're following the law of the books is larger than the isle of man and it's got so many of these smaller towns and the population would have to be in the tens of thousands. So the idea that this large island with all these little satellite communities would just stop for this one event is absolutely ludicrous. It's good to see another story about Harold, and I think that's an ongoing trend. We had a bad day for Harold the helicopter in Series 6, and obviously he's a marketable character. He's the only flying uh, sentient character in the franchise at this point. So Mm -hmm. by all means, he should get an episode, but I feel Howard kind of is one of those characters who has a big personality, but by logic of who he is and what he is, he works much better as an auxiliary character. I think one Mm. of Howard's strongest episodes, um, obviously his debut with Percy and Howard, but I think one of the second strongest episodes is Toby in the flood because Mm -hmm. he has such a importance in that. And he aids so much of the story. Um, and he's one of the most memorable parts of it. But it's a story about Toby. But I think here, when you kind of had that pulled away... And this is one of those stories where it does start to feel really watered down in terms of the content that we're getting. I think mm. we're seeing more signs of that here. Yeah, and touching on the point you said about Harold being an auxiliary character. I mean, think back to Percy's Promise, where all he does is just drop off Hoff drinks and... That's the purpose he serves, but it's Mm. a very fitting purpose, and yeah. There's only so many stories you can write about a helicopter going wrong. True. You you, you have engine trouble, you have them maybe crashing, and and, and that's really it. Engine trouble, that sounds a bit like a segue, Connor. I think you're a bit far ahead. I, 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 I was just, you know, hinting. Hinting. He's alluding to the future. He's dropping I've, already got, I've already got the next segue planned and it's got nothing to do with that. Okay, fine. Well, in that case, uh, I'll just dish out my score. Um, three. Two. Okay, Denim agrees with me. Let's move on. <laughs> We're not giving it any more thought. <laughs> From flying horses to flying balloons, the Scarlet Railway is opening a brand new branch line. And as Lady Hat and Sir Topham Hat... Uh, taking hot air balloon there, they start to crash to the ground. But luckily, Scar Lowy is running late once more, and he's able to take them to the grand opening. Mm. Now, Connor, you and M were pretty ambivalent about this. Mm. Like, your scores weren't overly generous, which surprised me, because 
I actually have a lot of fun with this one. This is one of the stories where it's so enjoyable and so rewatchable that it you can just recite it from memory. I mean, it's got so many great moments, uh, fantastic, hilarious interactions between Sir Topham and Lady Hat. And yeah, there are some drawbacks. Like, like what, what's the station again, Connor? What's it called? Rumbling Bridge. Rumbling Bridge, yes. I mean, we've, we've already <laughs> seen this station already in series seven like two or three times before and yet only now it's being opened up i mean this is the last time we ever see it is the the order of release of the episodes particularly correct to the timeline that these stories go in yeah i I will say the order of release or maybe even order of production probably doesn't lay true to the timeline of it all Mm. uh especially because grand opening was filmed after all the previous viewings of Rumbling Bridge Station, which means that the production order and release order roughly line up to be the same. Mm. Um, the only thing that I can use to explain away Rumbling Bridge's previous appearances is that that is when the rest of the line was under control. I agree with that, yeah. Mm, okay, if, if you say so, Connor. Uh, look, coming back to the points that you and M made in the episode, there are some fantastic aerial shots. It's always great to see the hot air balloon and hear its theme. Uh, I feel that the conflict, it's really just a MacGuffin for the the accident and Scarlo getting the Fat Controller to where he needs to be on time. So, yeah, that that's a bit of a letdown, but everything else is great. Yeah, I, I, I do have a good time with this episode as well. I think the biggest thing that comes to mind, it takes what worked well for an episode like Sir Topham Hatt's Holiday and kind of repurposes it here. The the humour with the the human characters, which is, I think, a welcome trend to each episode that we review. Um, and that back and forth banter between Sir Topham and Lady Hat, I think is quite nice. And, of course, seeing the hot air balloon in another kind of titular role. I, I do also have a fun time with this episode. I think it's great. It's enjoyable. Okay, then. So ratings. 8 out of 10 from me. And I'm going to give it a 7. So from a grand opening to grand engines, it is May Day on the island of Sodor, and as the station is being decorated, James suggests that why don't the engines become decorated as well? However, Gordon complains that decorations are undignified. However, he unwittingly ends up winning the best dressed engine contest. Hmm, through a pretty ridiculous means, I might add. Um, yet yeah, this story, it's forgettable. Like, like I, I remember seeing it once as a child, it didn't really take away much from it, and every time I go back to revisit it, I go, what, this happened? And this happened? I mean, yeah, it just, it's one of those things that wash over me. Um, I, I've really got nothing more to add here. Denim, help me out. <laughs> It's funny you say that, Perry, because I really enjoyed this episode. This episode was my first exposure to Murdoch, so I think it had that going for it when it came on. It was mine as well, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I first Mm. saw it on TV, I was kind of like, oh, a new character. This is one of the stories where it's Gordon at his best, and it kind of has similar notions to what was going for um, James and the Queen of Sodor. Like, it has that kind of feeling to it which i really enjoy it's it's one of those things where yes as we kind of said in Harold on the flying horse like there's a party going on or there's a festival and like the whole while and kind of revolves around that for the story but with that aside i think it does a lot of fun things with the characters of murdoch and gordon murdoch is kind of like yeah i'll come in into this competition but i don't really have much to say i'm just going to keep to myself and then Gordon, who is very against it, and has a magnificent crash with Trevor, the traction engine's cart, um, and a sign, I think um, is quite humorous. I think it goes up there in Gordon crashes. That's the other thing I wanted to raise, actually, because I completely forgot that Gordon had an accident in this with Trevor. I mean, it's only minor, but still, you'd think something like that would stick with you, and it just doesn't. It stuck with me, which is surprising. Like, I, I don't know, like, people have different experiences with different episodes, but, like, that crash was iconic for me as a kid. Okay. Hmm. Oh, also, we should settle this debate here, Denim. Who is at fault for that accident? Is it Gordon's crew, his driver and fireman, or is it the signalman? 
look, I think I'm going to have to say it's Sigmund. I think like okay. he has the opportunity to act on that, whereas it does take time to slow down a steam engine. Um, like he could not have fully stopped and still crashed into Trevor's cart. To be fair, the signalman should know that the express is coming. So yes, why would indeed. he let a slow traction engine through? But also more to the point that M was making, like the driver and fireman, their eyes aren't being obscured by a giant banner. Like they can see ahead of them. They know what's coming. This is true. This is where the ever so fading line between where the engine has control and where the crew has control comes back into discussion. Mm. Yeah, a- absolutely. Because they can't stop the train because it's the express, which means that if Gordon were in control, they would need to due to safety. Uh, so, of course. Ooh, it's a weird line. It is. Or maybe it's an outline. It's becoming more and more wonky. <laughs> Denim, what about your score? I'm going to give it a nine. Like, it's up there for me. It's one of the Series 7 episodes I always go to. I always have a fun time with it. What are you going to give it, Parry? Uh, I'm going to give it a six for the reasons I've outlined. Like, somehow I've seen this episode many a time over the years and it's never really stuck with me. So, yeah, but there are some, I guess memorable or iconic moments in there so for that reason it gets a slightly more generous score gordon's indignity continues in gordon spencer when gordon meets his better equal someone who's faster more arrogant ruder and overall more prone to failure as spencer gets stuck on gordon's hill and gordon needs to rescue him And uh, Spencer's a cousin of Gordon as well, technically, because they're both designed by Nigel Greasley, and they're both uh, London Northeastern Railway engines. Yeah, technically, you Mm. could count them as cousins. Yeah. The same that you count uh, Flying Scotsman as Gordon's brother. Yes, that's what I was alluding to. Mm. Um, Yeah, I, I don't really have any more to add to that, other than, you know, I can only echo what was said in Connor and M's review. Like, the editing's great. I love how, you know, Spencer flies past Gordon, Gordon's got one face on, and then when Spencer's out of shot, Gordon's got a different face on. Like, almost as though, as you said, Connor, like, there's almost no evidence there that they had had to change shots or anything like that. It it was Mm -hmm. a very clean cut. Yeah, clean cut. Yes, that's the that's the term I was looking for. Uh, Spencer's mm. theme is great as well. It's like pleasant everyday background music. I would call it. Uh, he's a very well written character. I think they nailed his persona. Um, mm. As you say, Connor, it's everything about Gordon ramped up to eleven. The only issue I would have here is that it feels like they're kind of uh, cut for time. So because we have characters speaking to each other or rather our narrator Michael Angelos he distinguishes he's able to distinguish between the voices of the character but at no point does he say it like James said or the fat controller said he doesn't even announce the fat controller's arrival when he comes to the yard it's just quiet there'll be a party for the Duke and Duchess at Mayplay I, I, I think it's probably more down to the style of writing that Lee Pressman has given I, I kind of like that Angelos is at the point now where he doesn't need to say the character's name to distinguish the different voices. I think, especially between Gordon, Spencer, James, and the Fat Controller, they all have very distinct voices. They do, that's true. I mean, you can't mistake James for everybody, anybody else. Like, this is Spencer, he's the fastest engine in the world! (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I think think that would be my uh, point of argument there. Mm. One thing that I forgot to mention during... Uh, the actual review of the episode was I forgot to mention how much like a railway series story and character this feels. It is. It's very much an Audrey esque story. I mean, you'd be mistaken for thinking that, <clears throat> excuse me, for thinking that he himself wrote it. Yeah. Mm. It's wonderful, in my opinion. So I'm expecting good ratings from you two. I'll let Denim go first. Well, I think it'd be very happy, Connor. This was my first ever exposure to Series 7, so I think I had a lot going for it. Um, and I love that Gordon has finally... It's taking him this long to meet his match, to meet someone who is distant in relation, but is far away enough that they will challenge him and they will kind of 
squash Gordon Zego. And I think for as long as Spencer continues in the TV show, I think it's something that I really am happy that they continue to build on. So it's a 10 from me. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, nice, um, Harry, don't let me down. Uh, I'm going to give it the same score that M gave it, and that's an 8. For the reasons I've outlined, you know, I think there are... Certain elements they could certainly do better, but the elements they've done well, they've done really well. So from silver engines to silver landscapes in not-so-hasty puddings, when Elizabeth is telling Thomas that he's not reliable enough. However, when collecting the Christmas puddings, Elizabeth gets stuck in a snowdrift and Thomas comes to her rescue. Hmm. Yeah, not fond of this one, honestly. I know... We all talk about the snowy landscapes of the island of Sodor and how much they love them, but here it, it just doesn't have that same appeal. I'm not quite sure how to put my finger on it, but uh, yeah, it's just... You know what I think it is? I think it's the mm. fact that they use the grey skies and the white landscape. It has a very kind of be flat it. look, whereas when it, mm. whenever it is the bright blue sky, the snow stands out. Hmm, that's true, yeah. That, that might be it, actually. Yeah, I want to bring up a point that um, Lachlan made as well in his review uh, about them kind of anticipating that it was the end and that's potentially why they integrated all this old footage into the episode or the editing of the episode. Yeah, again, it just reeks of laziness to me. Like, when we see that shot of Henry from Series 1, with it's a shot from The Flying Kiva, but the added like cgi snowflakes onto the front of the screen and i just see that and i think seriously guys you could have gone to more effort than that sure it's the laziest so, shot in the whole show I'll yeah i'd have now. to agree with that well a sec- second laziest i'll come to the laziest in a moment but um <laughs> okay um yeah not not a lot's happening i mean sir topham hat's preoccupation with children needing their pudding rather than you know uh, is elizabeth okay and is Thomas really the best person to set up to rescue her? I think those are things which really need to be addressed. Love seeing Terence. It's a pity that this has to be his last appearance, though. Reiterating the points, it's a weak story. It's too disjointed. But before I... Actually, I'm preempting myself here. I was about to say my score, but Denim, is there anything you can add? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have to agree with a lot of the points that are made. I think the only saving grace of this episode is seeing Terence, but like you can go back and see him in many other episodes. Um, w- one thing that was spoken about um, in the previous review is that Terence is just kind of left there, and like that's it. Like they they don't address him again, and it's, it, it does show that like this episode is very lazily put together. It feels like a bit of an afterthought, and it kind of leans into. That ongoing question, the more and more that we kind of transition through different areas, like, what's the Fat Controller's authority in, like, the Island of Soda? Like, why is he doing things elsewhere when he's supposed to be running a railway? I like that they use Elizabeth, but, like, I feel like she's got stronger stories than this one. Um, Stronger previously and in the future as well. Um, I thought her her appearance in Thomas and the Tuba was rather well earned but i think here it's cool that like they try to do an accident by a road but there's no sell-off it doesn't feel like thomas and the missing christmas tree it doesn't feel like thomas and um percy's uh christmas adventure in the sense that there is a big rescue or anything like that when it should have that feeling if they're getting terence to be involved then the stakes are ramped up it should have a big selling off point but it doesn't it's it, it's weak yeah, and, and there's no festive spirit to it either. Like, even though it's supposed to be a Christmas story or a holiday story, it's just like, you know, where's where's the bells and whistles, you know? Where's the lights? Where's the carols? Where's Santa and all that kind of thing? Yeah. It's... It, it ends in the, probably the most industrial place on Sodor, the docks. Mm. Oh, theory me. Um, I was going to make another point here. Oh, that's right. So... Going back to what Denham said there about Sir Topham Hatch and his role within the island, it's just occurred to me that he kind of sees himself as like an entrepreneurial figure, like a Richard Branson or an Elon Musk type. He just feels like he's got to put his money and his name everywhere in order to get the recognition that he deserves. Ooh. Yeah, I, I can't agree point. with that more. That's really good. So mm. ratings then? Three. Zero. 
<laughs> oh. oh. Wait, zero? zero? Yeah. This so will make are you, are the you first saying, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let, let me just stop everyone there. Denim, are you saying that a blank screen would be preferable to this story? Yes. <laughs> oh. This is not oh. festive. It is not fun. It's lazily put together in production, in post-production, in writing. I have no time for it. I'm trying to get my head around this. So, Edward, Trevor, really useful party. Make someone happy. Th- those episodes are better. Oh. Ooh. Okay, then. So, from Thomas being reliable to reliable, rusty, and trusty, rusty where Rusty alerts other engines about the old wooden bridge being damaged, how the Duncan ignores him, and later on the quest for coal, Duncan is trapped on the crumbling bridge when Rusty rescues him. One very interesting thing about this story, and that we have seen in other stories, is that the team, and I think rightfully so, but the team love to capitalise on this idea of Rusty being the protagonist and Duncan always being the antagonist or the, the anti-hero. And it, it's something that we have seen since Duncan was first brought into the show and they continue to use that same trope here. Which I don't like, honestly. You'd think that by now the animosity between Duncan and Rusty would have disappeared by now, gone away. But no, it's still here. I think it would have been more interesting if like, we had Sir Hando and Duncan against each other. That would have been more interesting, yes, absolutely. If Sir Handel was the one who found, like, or even Duncan was the one who found the defect in the bridge and he told Sir Handel or vice versa, yeah, that would make for a much more interesting conflict for sure. But I wanted to raise a point about the title of the episode because, as Connor said, uh, I believe it was you, Connor, you said that Rusty to the Rescue would be a more agreeable title. M. Oh, M said it. Okay. Yeah, but even then, like, Rusty Saves the Day, that would be a better title again, which was one of the Series 6 stories. Mm. Imagine if Rusty Saves the Day was called Trusty Rusty, and this was called Rusty Saves the Day. <laughs> that would be much better, honestly, be- because it makes more sense. It does. It, for Rusty Saves the Day to be called Trusty Rusty, because it, it doesn't necessarily save the day, but um, it, he, he's proven how trusty he is. And whereas in this one, he does save the day because he saves an engine from a rather satisfying bridge collapse. Mm. As Connor pointed out. Oh, I just want to say as well, the editing's not quite flawless. Because, it's not flawless. Yeah, you can see the crossfade, that little transition there. But um, And I think again, Connor, this was your point. Yeah, there is a serious problem with coal on a Scarlo railway because, you know, Tr- Duncan goes to a bunker where it should be there and there's not any... And also, Duncan's crew are the real villains of this story. Yeah. I mean, they're careless and they are just absolutely idiotic. I mean, first of all, running off without Cole, but second, letting him go across the bridge and then, well, they, they stay with him while there's Rusty ventures onto the bridge and there's this beautiful point of view shot as he does that. But otherwise, yeah, why would you put not only yourselves at risk, but your engine at risk by you know going across the bridge when you know you're about to run out of steam yeah you make some good points parry i think like it's it's one of those stories where i i wish like obviously they won't because the story is about the engine it would have been nice to have seen a, a rewrite of this story where there's more consequence placed on the actions of duncan's driver and fireman here maybe the fat controller scolds them that would be a much better resolution, I think. In terms of a score, because I think we've said all that we need to here, I'll give it a six. I'll give it a four. Mm, mm. Okay, Mr. Then. Grumpy Pants over here. <laughs> Ga- oh, no, no, I'm, 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 just, I'm just a critical viewer. It's not a zero. Well, Gave true. the podcast the first zero and you call the two a, grump- a, a four a Grumpy Pants? <laughs> no, that's a second zero. Is it? Yeah, make someone happy. Was that a zero? It was. I, I remember yeah. there was a huge stink kicked up about it. 
I, I'm sorry. It was just tra- tra- too traumatic for me to remember mm. that. Just gonna. I mean, I feel like I had to give another episode a zero to kind of weigh it out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But not so hasty puddings is not worse than make someone happy. But we're past that. Well, we are past that. From a rusty racing to save the day to Thomas racing Bertie. It's the children's annual sports day, and Thomas wants to win a medal. So he races Bertie to try and get a medal of his own. However, Sir Topham pulls him aside and says, I've forgotten the medals. So Thomas races to Napford, picks up the medals, and becomes the hero of the sports day. And at the very end, Sir Topham, Bertie, and the children reward Thomas with a medal of his own. Yeah, how could how you could forget a bunch of medals with your own face on them, I don't know, but somehow that manages to happen. Um... <laughs> it, it goes to your idea of him being an entrepreneur that wants his face everywhere. Yeah, exactly. There are shades of Ted Turner to this one. Um, our older <laughs> listeners might remember that when the Olympic boycott happened way back in the 80s, Ted Turner decided to host his own version of the Olympics called... Oh, the Friendship Games or something like that. And uh, it ended up being successful for the first couple of times it ran, but then afterward it sort of tapered off. So, hmm, yeah. But anyhow, m- moving away from that, um, I can't really m- add m- any... Moving on to Three Cheers for Thomas. <laughs> yes, I-, I can't really add any more than what Lachlan M and Connor said in the story. But I will say this. Li- ha- having heard what you had to say in the review it made me appreciate the story slightly more because before this, I was just not at all interested in this at all. I just thought it was a really lackluster story. I think Lachlan raised that point. Uh, it's It just feels like nothing happens. Like, there's no meaty conflict. There's no... Uh, sa- the resolution isn't all that satisfying. And, yeah, there's just a limited number of characters here and because of that it doesn't feel like a celebration at all it just feels like you know an an everyday occurrence it's yeah there's not a lot of appeal i have for this and and i know that everyone else really adores it but for me it's just there's the classic dad joke from percy about the egg and spoon races and then it's all downhill from there for me like they this is the part that frustrates me most of all right they use stock footage from series one of Thomas, you know, with the green embankments in the background. Mm. The way they put place it in the story, I mean, it's just, as I've been saying time and time again throughout this episode, it's just lazy. It feels like they've taken a piece of B-roll and said, right, let's just go with that. Let's put it in there. The kids won't know and they won't care and then just move on. I, I, I've had to watch this story several times kind of in lead up to this to really kind of solidify my opinion on it because I, I, I feel there's there's things I like and there's things I don't like about it and I do appreciate the points that um, yourself Connor um, and M and Lachlan made in this story like there's little nuances to the original great race that happened with Thomas and Birdie with the, the music and, and the pacing of it but I feel like this could have been done so much more better there's so much opportunity for humor the humor that's like the fact controller forgot the medals could have been played up so much more and I, it makes me feel like this story would exist better in like the Brenner era like it has that kind of like comedic beating to it definitely yes but i think for what it is here it's just kind of more state of fact rather than humor i, I think like this era goes off quietly. Like, it, it's no Christmas episode that we get at the end of series two or three. Like, there, there, there's no triumphant hurrah. And then we kind of move into whatever the next season is. It's a greater sign of the times that we're kind of looking at. And, like, yeah, it, 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 it's it's one that I feel very torn on, but I'm 100% like kind of in the in the state of mind that, like, I'm, I'm not really a fan of it either. Like, I have to agree with Parry on this one. Yeah. Um, well, then um, g- give out your score, because I think I'm going to get lynched for mine. Uh, look, m- maybe I'll get more lynched than you. I'm going to say a two. Um, okay. For, for what it is, cool. It's an episode. 
I'm putting up an awkward thumbs up as I say that. <laughs> but, like, beyond that, it's not much. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so a two from Denim. Um, I'm going with my lowest ever score, which is one and a half. Ooh, Ooh. Okay. I, I, I was going to go with a one, a solid one, but then I think, as I said, the arguments that Lachlan and M made, and Connor, in their... Yeah, hi, I'm here ep- as well. <laughs> yes, in their episode 58 review, they kind of won me over a little bit, and I do like that they incorporated the instrumental of Let's Have a Race into the story, but yeah, it's just... Nichts besonderes, as they say in Germany. You, you see, you two... Like- Whilst I wasn't like fully praising this episode, I really enjoyed it. So I just think that you two are mean, mean misters. No, uh, oh, he's done which... it again. <laughs> he's done it again. That, that Connor, Jonas. Which leads us to a musical interlude, because you may remember a while ago, uh, similarities were brought up between the Beatles song "Me and Mister Mustard." And the Thomas the Tank Engine theme. So here is Thomas the Tank's version of Mean Mr. Mustard by the Beatles now that it has been Thomasified. That was our good friend Thomas the Tank with his cover of Mean Mr. Mustard, which of course was the inspiration for Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell's Thomas the Tank Engine theme. And you are listening to the Right on Track podcast where we talk all things Thomas the Tank Engine and friends. We've already covered some of the stories from Series 7 that Denim and I missed out on reviewing the first time around. But now we are throwing the floor open to me because it's my turn to review some stories which I haven't covered yet on the podcast and we're going way back to the very first episodes from Series 1. Those being, Connor? Those being Thomas and Gordon, Edward and Gordon, the sad story of Henry, and Edward, Gordon and Henry because... The very first episode of the podcast, the pilot episode, was just Denim and myself. And Parry only joined us from the second episode onwards. And Mm -hmm. considering that we're at an end of the era with Series 7, and we've reviewed these missed episodes of Series 7, now we're going to be giving Parry the chance to review those first four episodes of Series 1 to sort of round off this era of... Mm. Thomas the Tank Engine. Thomas likes whistling rudely at him. Wake up, lazy bones. Why don't you work hard like me? You watch me, little Edward, as I rush through with the express. That will be a splendid sight for you. Goodbye, little Edward. Look out for me this afternoon. The guard blew his whistle till he had no more breath and waved his flag till his arms ached. I'm not going to spoil my lovely green paint and red stripes for you. Oh dear, said Gordon. We were going so nicely too. And look, there's Henry laughing at me. Tiny little snippets of those stories. But of course, if you want to hear them again, you can always make your way back to episode one of the Right on Track podcast. Or just, you know, watch the episodes on YouTube. They're probably still there unless someone's taken them down. 
Or on your DVD. Yes, DVDs. Yep. Or, or on your legally obtained DVD. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or on your illegally obtained VHS. Yeah. <laughs> the VHS black market. Yeah, do people still steal VHS players? Yeah. Yeah, there's two out there. Mm. Yeah, okay. probably. They're becoming the next vinyl. But, oh, no. didn't know that. Oh. That's intriguing. It's making... Making a comeback. Very intriguing. Um, so, let, let, let's go on with these four retrospects mm-hmm. and reviews. Yes. Starting with Thomas N. Gordon. Okay, so, yes. We, well, we know the story here. We're essentially being introduced to Thomas the Tank Engine, who uh, lives at, works at the big station by the sea. He's got six small wheels, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy boiler, and a short stumpy dome. He's a cheeky little engine too, always pushing and pulling coaches about, ready for the engines to take on long journeys. The bigger engines to take on long journeys, that is. And then he takes the coaches away when the engines return so that they can go to the sheds and rest. You're, you're basically quoting the episode verbatim here, Parry. <laughs> Not not verbatim, it's not quite accurate, but yes. Close. That, it, this, Th- Thomas and Gordon is essentially the perfect exposition, not just for Thomas, not just for Gordon, but for the entire show, mm. really. I mean, they do such a wonderful job of setting up its world and its characters. Like, it, It's a good minute or so that it spends introducing Thomas and we get some rather lovely B-roll footage of Gordon and Henry leaving the station... And then Tom is shunting, and of course got the Diddy in the background, the, the busy station theme. I yes, think it's it is the. Du, 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 du. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a, a, yeah, you you could just listen to that on a loop, yeah. couldn't you? A, 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 and of course, uh, Thomas and Gordon, known in the US as Thomas gets tricked, is based off the story of the same name from the second book of the Railway series, Thomas the Tank Engine. Yes, exactly right. And it does, having read the original story course and familiar with it, it more or less is a direct adaptation of that story. Mm. Like, there's nothing in here which has been added. Yeah. There's nothing here which has been changed for, you know, the sake of artistic integrity or whatever. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Almost word for word, page for page, an adaptation of that original story. I, I do have to ask a question, and it comes to that point where, where at the very start, this is the establishment of Thomas as a TV entity. The jump from the stories prior being the Railway series to now having the, the larger focus on Thomas as a main protagonist. What are your feelings, Parry? Mm, well, it makes sense for Thomas to be the central character of the TV series because he is the most popular of the Railway series characters and definitely the most marketable. But with that said, there's a whole range of other engines and other stories which we can focus on. Like, aside from Thomas, Henry is the one who has appeared in the most Railway series stories. And particularly in later seasons of the television show, he kind of gets shafted to one side and Thomas is, of course, made to be the centre. But there's a lot more interesting stories to write and to direct with other characters than there is just with Thomas. And I think this is the point that Mike the Buried Truck made when he came on the podcast too. Yeah. Imagine if we got James the Red Engine and Friends. That would be so bizarre. Or or Percy and Friends even. Considering that he was the first character made, Edward and Friends. Yeah, it it could have been Edward and Friends. That would have been interesting as well. But... um, yeah, um, Connor, I understand you've got some facts that you wanted to share that weren't shared in the original episode that you and Denim did. Yeah, so uh, of course, as it's been approaching three years since that first episode of the podcast was first recorded, more things have come to light and more research has been able to be done. So mm-hmm. uh, for the entirety of Series 7, uh, filming lasted for about seven months for the full 26 episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and cost, according to the Sunday Telegraph, five hundred thousand pounds to produce those twenty six episodes. It would be interesting to know if we could compare it to one of its contemporaries, like Postman Pat, for instance, or Fireman mm. Sam. How much would they have cost to produce, especially their first series? Mm. Yes, sure. Um, uh, another thing is, uh, Ringo Starr uh, spent eight days recording the dubs for this episode. Yeah, I can believe that. Yeah. And furthermore, 
uh, some of the sound effects that we hear of the chuffing and puffing and moving of the engines were originally recorded at the Tallinn Railway in Wales, the basis for the Scarlowy. How about that? It's like it's almost like everything comes full circle, right? It, it, it is full circle. Like, like, of course, I can't change the scores uh, that Denim and I have gave it. Uh, we originally rated Thomas and Gordon a 7.5 and a 6.5 respectively. Yeah, we've got our hands tied behind our backs for this one. And I remember at, at the time that I said I gave it a 6.5 because I knew that there was more to come. I knew greater things would happen in this series. But in the score that I gave, I felt... It did a good job of, as you said, Perry, quite aptly setting up that world. All right. Um, as I said, it's great exposition, a fantastic primer for the stories to come. And I honestly love it. I think the music is fantastic. The narration is great. The conflict is good as well. Eight out of ten. Ooh, nice. Okay, then. That... Yeah, th- this is... Uh, we say this a lot, but this is a classic Thomas story, and it's classic for a reason. Yeah, and that would actually make you the highest rating between the three of us. It would. Yeah. It would indeed, but that is a trend that's not going to continue. <laughs> Six, seven, eight. Ooh, so with Thomas and Gordon, we move to Edward and Gordon, where Edward is an old engine who's smaller than all the others, mm. that's a lie. And uh, he, he goes out, takes some coaches, has a wonderful day, and the next day when Gordon pulls a goods train, he gets stuck on his hill, and Edward goes and saves him. Mm-hmm. That's right. Now, this is where the limitations of the budget come in here, because we see uh, gathered around the sheds are five engines. As you say, Edward's not the smallest, because Thomas no. is also there. Um, and we've got James as well, who we haven't been introduced to yet, formally. Mm. And he's the same size as Edward. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, he's, James is slightly bigger. And as it turns out, he's slightly older as well. Really? Yeah, because I, I don't know whether you've been following the fandom recently, Connor, but James's basis was built before Edward's basis was. What? What? But yeah. yeah. Yeah, Denim, back me up here. Yeah, no, it, it's all true. I've known this forever. Hmm? Wait, hang on. But but James was built in, like, 1912. Mm-hmm. And Edward was built after him. No. Yes. Yes, yes. No, no, yes. no, no. no. But, but because Edward worked in the furnace with Albert, and those stories take place in the 1980s. But... 1980s? Then that makes him definitely younger than James. No, it says here that Edward was built in 1896. Well, what are you reading? I'm reading the wiki. Oh, okay. And considering that he's based off a Furnace Railway K2 Lager Cedar, well, I say Lager, Larger Seagull, mm-hmm. which were originally built in 1986. Meanwhile, James is based off a uh, London and... Uh, no, Lanc- Lancashire and Yorkshire... Yorkshire? Lancashire Yorkshire. and Yorkshire Class 28, uh, which were first uh, built in 1909. Hmm. So I don't know where you're getting your sources from, guys. Well, that, that still means that James is the s- older than Henry and Gordon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, J- James, uh, Henry and Gordon were around about 1920s. Thomas mm. was 1911. Mm. So so between all of I... them, Thomas is the second oldest. That's And yet he's treated like, you know, the, the child of the group, the young one. Yes, so... he's small. Mm. Small, 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 teeny, weeny, weeny. Yes, but, but <laughs> nice Magic Railroad reference there, Connor. Well done. Um, thank you. Thank yes. you. <laughs> You're welcome, Denim. Um, coming back to the story, yeah, as I said, budget limitations, we've got engines here who we haven't been introduced to yet, some of whom are smaller than Edward, even though he's supposed to be the smallest, so, yeah, they they could have at least used a facsimile of Gordon or Henry or something like that, or maybe purchased Mm. another, like, Macklin model and stuck someone else's face onto it. I don't know. Here's an idea. Simply not have Thomas seen in any of this episode. Mm, that's Because then... True. Could, ah, that would just work so much better. But anyways. Yeah. But, he um, had to come on in. Yeah. 
anyway, so yeah, the story I feel. I mean, I like Edward. We all love Edward, but there's not a lot of depth to this. It's just Edward comes out of the shed, has a day out, goes home again, and then the next day he helps Gordon up a hill with a goods tray. I mean, there's not a lot of excitement here, apart from when Edward runs away down the hill and he's got his shocked face, and then Mm. when he reaches the water tower, he's got James's face for some reason, and he turns green. Hmm. Well, yeah. the, the, the thing is, yeah. there would be technically even less to this episode if it was more faithful to the Railway series. Well, that's true, because this is a combination... Well, in the original Edward's Day Out story, doesn't he help a guard or something like that? Uh, a guard is running late. Ah, so he helps the guard to... Yeah. Edward and Gordon, also known as Edward Helps Out in the US, is based off the first two stories in the first Railway series book, The Three Railway Engines. Uh, with the stories being Edward's Day Out and Edward and Gordon. And Edward's Day Out starts the same as the TV series. He goes and picks up coaches. Then a guard is running late, so he can't leave the station, until the guard runs down the hill, hops in, blows his whistle, off they go, have a wonderful day. And then the second arc of the TV series story is a fairly faithful adaption to the railway series Edward and Gordon. Mm-hmm. Uh, with uh, what, what's really interesting though is that Edward's day out okay it's given so little screen time it, it's such a small part of this episode it is yeah yeah it was the very first story ever created when Reverend Audrey sat down and made up a story to tell his son Christopher to entertain him whilst he was sick with measles Mm -hmm. And and that was the first story told, yet we get next to nothing of it, and half of that story being cut. Yeah. I guess it makes sense in the world of logic, because the simplicity of it is so easy to come up with, and then from there, naturally, quite by happenstance, Audrey then builds more and more and more onto that world, adding more lore, characters, and setting to it. So you can tell that it's Mm -hmm. his first. You can. But and I think you might have shared this on a podcast before, but Edward, the name was a pure coincidence. Like Christopher just asked, what, what was the engine's name, Daddy? And he goes, uh, Edward. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah, it works. Oh, we go. La, da, 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 da. Mm. So, uh, well, yeah. Do, do you consider this to be a faithful adaptation, Parry? Well, it's, it's definitely faithful, but it's... I think that's its biggest drawback. Like, I wish it had been slightly more exciting and I had done more of it. Mm. Yeah, it, it's just a a rather middling adventure, this one. So if I were to score it, I'd give it a 5 out of 10. A 5? Yeah, it's not a terrible story and I do enjoy it, but it's just, yeah. As Denon was saying before, we know there's more to come. Yeah. But that's quite interesting, because when Denim and I first reviewed this episode, we both gave it an 8. Hmm. So, okay, okay. Okay, so now let's move on to what's probably the most well-known story, I'd say. The most talked about, the yep. most controversial. Oh my goodness, One. Thomas is so scary, I'm not going to show it to my child again. <laughs> yeah, I- I- exactly. <laughs> The sad story of Henry, otherwise known as Come Out Henry. Hmm, yes. It's interesting. Well, we know what happens, of course. Henry's, well, once an engine attached to a train is afraid of a few drops of rain, he whooshed through a tunnel, blew smoke through his funnel, and never came out again. Yeah. That's it, isn't it? I've quoted it verbatim. Yeah, yeah, you have. Pretty much, yeah. Then the director of the railway arrives... Yeah, he, he's well in the TV series he's referred to as the Fat Controller, but in the original stories he's known as the Fat Director. Yes, correct. And and he arrives and tries to encourage Henry out of the tunnel, and they they him well he doesn't, but he encourages the passengers to pull, and then encourages the passengers to push. Then they get an engine to push, which is Thomas. But Henry still doesn't budge, so they brick him up in the tunnel where he will stay. For always and always. Mm. And always. Yes. And always. 
which is this story is based off the third story of the same name from the three railway engines. Mm. Now, may I ask at this point, what is it about this episode that's so traumatic? I, I know, it, like it's become this focal point within this culture war surrounding Thomas. It's basically how everyone else interprets it is that Henry is locked up for not doing what he's supposed to, which is taking a train, but... Uh, the fat controller's logic in my mind is, well, if you're not going to move from the tunnel and these passengers have got to get going somewhere, then we may as well just, br- let, you know, brick up the tunnel, leave you there. Mm. Be- because there's nothing we can do about it. It's interesting, uh, though, because in the US dump of this episode, mm-hmm. uh, the narrations changed so that the wall was built to stop other engines from bumping into Henry. Yes, Exactly. And, and that Henry would only stay there until he was ready to leave. It reminds me of like when you're a young kid, you you, you want to stay somewhere or you're doing something and mum or dad says, okay, I'm going now. And then you go, no, wait, don't leave me here. Yeah. Kind of reminds mm. me of that kind of situation. You see, there's something very, very interesting about this story. Mm. though, and, and I feel it would make more sense if more people knew this, but... Both the TV series and the railway series illustrations are inaccurate as to what actually happened. Because, as mentioned by uh, Wilbur Audrey, there was only ever one tunnel. Yes. There wasn't a second tunnel next to it, there was only one. So as Henry got stuck there, he was essentially blocking the entire railway from getting through. Mm, and they had to drill a second tunnel through the two hills at Balahu in order to, um, yeah, accommodate for this mistake. I but, feel that little bit of extra detail, was it, whilst it doesn't really take away the horror of a living entity being locked in the cask of a mantelado uh, forever and ever, it does m- make his punishment a little more fitting, I feel. Mm-hmm. Because Henry has trapped all the engines from not being able to move through, has stopped all business being functional Mm. until this new tunnel is built. So, hey, if you're not going to let anyone through at all, we're not going to let you at all. Mm. I I think there are a couple of other interesting theories that fans have put out there. One is that Henry Mm. was trying to disguise his mechanical issues by pretending to be afraid of the rain. Ooh, unlike that, because of course Henry uh, mm. was based off stolen plans mm-hmm. um, in, in quite a spy movie uh, and was a failed engine. I like that theory. I like it. So it's not so much fear mm. of the rain or being afraid of spoiling his paint as it is not wanting his mechanical problems exposed to the world, I guess you could say. I like that. I, mm. I, I may I may subscribe to that theory. Or, or the other the the other theory is as well is that he did actually have those mechanical issues, and um, the the story is more or less an urban legend, a myth, if you will, regarding you know why he was locked up in the tunnel. What I feel is most surprising about this adaptation of the sad story of Henry, mm. it's not the first time it occurred. Is it because not? Because. In 1953, June 14th, the BBC decided to adapt this episode using double O gauge models. Aha. However, some of the points and switches on the track were not set properly, causing the Henry model to derail. Mm. Now, due to the standards of the time, the program was being broadcasted live, and many viewers were surprised when a giant hand came down and lifted the Henry model back onto the track. God? (laughs) (laughs) As well as that, the adaptation of the story infuriated Audrey so much that he barred the BBC from ever adapting any of his works ever again. Mm. Hence, why Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends premiered on ITV. Uh, And I believe that will also, also explain why it took another 31 years before any Thomas adaption graced the television screens again. Mm-hmm. Look, I, I think that it gets a bad rap. I think that everyone who's up in arms about it is just, you know, 
It's a storm and a teacup, really. I, kids aren't going to be traumatised by this. I was never traumatised by it. I thought it was it just washed over me. It's like, oh, okay, oh, yeah. So they're looking up in the tunnel. You know, as as Denham said, it's no different to you know a parent leaving you a place where you want to stay or being locked up in your room or something like that. So. I think the most ominous part, though, is in yeah. the British narration where Ringo Starr goes, I think he deserved his punishment, don't you? And it's like, whoa, that's... A, that, did, did he, though? <laughs> is, is that... But, but in George Carlin's narration, I knew you were going to raise this point, Connor, so I preemptively st- stopped you off. He, he's more apprehensive. He's like, don't you? Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. He, he, le- he leaves it as a more open-ended question, really. Yeah, instead of a rhetorical question, actually asking it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I do enjoy this story. Uh, I do like it a lot. It's got some great music, especially the Fat Controllers theme, which we all love. Mm-hmm. Um, and the tunnel, the brick building, the brick lane yes. theme, that music is awesome. Yes, which is also... We've only ever heard it once. Yeah. Which is, yeah, in that story. Yeah. And it's also uh, the first uh, use of stop motion in the show. It is indeed, yes. So, what would you rate this episode? Out of a 10, Connor, I would give it a 7. Ooh, okay. Ooh. Which, actually, you fall in the perfect average between... I gave it a 7.5 and Denim gave it a 6. Mm-hmm. Which Down leads us ground. to the final episode of the first episode of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Now, in... The 60th episode of the podcast, which was yep. Edward, Gordon, and Henry. The final story in the Railway Series book, Three Railway Engines. And it wasn't originally going to exist. because Oh, when, oh yes. Yeah, but because when the Reverend Audrey yeah. originally published and went to publishers about the first three stories of the Three Railway Engines, which was Edward Stay Out, Edward and Gordon, and the Sad Story of Henry... Mm-hmm. They urged him to write a fourth story, which would be increasing the length of the book, getting Henry out of the tunnel, and bringing Edward, Gordon, and Henry together for a happy ending. Like, pretty much that's what happens. Yeah, that's that's it. So, uh, Gordon has his first accident. He bursts his safety valve just outside of the tunnel where Henry is blocked off. And then, of course, Edward comes in, tries to... Does he try to push or pull the train? Which one is it? Well, in the railway series, he tries, he tries to push. Yeah, in the TV series, he tries to push it. In the railway series, he tries to pull it. Mm, and then, of course, he can't do either of those actions, so it's up to Henry. And even though he's covered in cobwebs or he's, re- and he's really stiff, like just remember this. He hasn't been polished or cleaned or oiled or anything like that for goodness knows how many months, and yet he's able to fire himself up and back out of the tunnel, find the turntable and back onto the train with absolutely no issue whatsoever. And just in the meantime, the passengers are... Yeah, the passengers are off to the side, just, you know, casually looking and saying, oh, when's our train coming? Oh, gee, this is taking a while. (laughs) Yeah. The the (laughs) thing is, is that Henry could have been in there for anywhere up to a full year. And there are some people who believe he's still in the tunnel. Not not mentioning names of Twitter users who we might have had an argument with. <laughs> Some people were turned off after episode three. <laughs> yeah. That's it, I'm not watching anymore. Yeah. <sighs> Henry will always be in the tunnel. You would see in the story Thomas's Train yes. that Henry exists there. And in all the stories after that. I would encourage everybody who's apprehensive about Thomas and Friends at this point, you know, don't use that story to judge the show alone. Because as we've uncovered through seven seasons of this podcast now, it is such a smarter and more richer show. Like, there's all these intricate little details on there. There's all these uh, clever stories, you know. Yeah, just give it a chance. Like... The look beyond the Edward Gordon and Henry, and yeah, you'll find some gems in there. Be better than the Karens. Be, yes. <laughs> the bar isn't too high. So, <laughs> Parry. <laughs> did this episode, uh, by the sounds of it, I think you like it. I do, honestly. Um, I can't really quite explain why. I think it's partly nostalgia, but it's also the fact that, you know, we've got all these... A, a nice little things in there. Again, it's the music, that's the effects, like seeing Gordon, you know, stop on the line in like 
like what can only be described as like a smog machine. You know, there's all this steam coming out of him. And, um, oh yeah, the little ditty of Henry laughing. I love that as well. But yes. Do, 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 do. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm going to give it another seven. Which would actually make it the lowest out of the three of us. Because if you give... Would it now? Yeah, okay. you gave it a 7, Denim gave it a 7.5, and I gave it an 8.5. Hmm. I, I think part of the reason why I've given it 7 is because it's a very static episode. You know, it just takes place in that one location for most of the time. Yeah. And that is it, though, because we have now come to the end of this sort of retrospective review covering the 10 episodes from Peace and Quiet to Three Cheers for Thomas that Denim and Parry missed in Series 7 when they were off doing whatever they did, and the four Mm -hmm. episodes that Parry missed within the very first episode of the podcast being Thomas and Gordon, Edward and Gordon, The Sad Story of Henry, and Edward, Gordon and Henry. Mm, quite right. But this is not the end for us. No, no, no. We may have covered the golden age of Thomas, but there's a lot more to come. Yes, we will be returning in Series 8. And I believe we may have a little something to show you. They said, okay, what can we do to fill this out? I know, let, let's just have these really, really long shots that we can hold on. All it does is slow down the story. I've seen funeral processions that are faster <laughs> than this. I highly recommend this, maybe even as a starter looker or even for the most experienced one. Okay, so I've arrived at Sydney Central. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning. I am yet to go to the Blue Mountains, so I'm really excited about that. But let's see what they've got. Currently the problem I have, I'll pack everything into a box and take it and just run two trains. I feel like it's more of a social club. I used to bring like boxes and boxes of trains and put them all out the track and be like, yeah, and then just not end up running more than half. All of Series 8 just feels like the worst kind of lazy Sunday. The fact that this one falls a bit flat, it doesn't disappoint me as much. We're definitely hitting country now, and so far I'm having a really, really great time. So a lot to look forward to there, and you did hear two other voices which may be familiar to you because we are bringing Lachlan and M onto the podcast as permanent fixtures. They are going to be joining us as co-hosts and we couldn't be more pleased or prouder of their involvement. Jo- joining the Right on Track team. Yes, yeah. exactly. But I'm afraid that is the end of episode 60 of the Right on Track podcast with Connor, Parry and Denham. In the meantime, once you wait for Series 8 to come crashing through your Station Master's window, you can catch up with us on all of our social media, such as our Instagram, T-T-T-E underscore right on track. There's also our Twitter, which is at OnTrackThomas. Or our Facebook, which is right on track Thomas Podcast. Mm. And if you want to keep in contact with us, you can reach out to us via our email which is rightontrackthomas at gmail.com. You can also visit us on our brand new website where we've got lots of treasure troves of information from the past, but things to look forward to in the future, which is rightontrackpodcast.org. Yes, it's had a wonderful facelift since the last time it was up, and we hope you enjoy it. But we will return next time with the new format, new voices... And the new series of Thomas. But until that time comes, I'm still Connor. I'm still Parry. And I'm still Denim. And this has been the Ride on Track podcast. Adios, guys. Bye-bye. See you later.